I'm here with Jeff Hacker with a very unusual car. Uh, what, what's the official name? Uh, the uh, Comet. The owner, builder, and designer were Frank Curtis and Paula Mahandro. Okay. And so it was actually a car conceived in 1945, uh, press released in 1946. Okay. And then uh, the car was finished in early 47. Uh, before any automobile magazine started in, uh, in post-war America. This is the first documented post-war sports car. Okay. We've been going through and looking through magazines, newspapers, right. popular signs, those kinds of uh, issues. And uh, the very first coach-built new sports car to hit, and they all came out right after World War II. So right, there were right. quite a few. In fact, some of them are here. But this was the first and the earliest document. And how many cars had Frank Curtis built prior to this? Because he was obviously pretty prolific. I know certainly well into the 50s. Well, Frank Curtis built mostly the race cars. Right. He built um, one, one or two sports cars prior to the war, pre-war. Okay. And then after the war, he actually designed this for Paulo Mahandro, and Paulo Mahandro built this out of the Comet Company in Los Angeles. I see. They were partners and worked together. And how many did projects. they build? Did they build very many? Um, two. And this oh, car, just two? Okay. Yeah, this car was actually missing <coughs> for about 50 years. Um, wow. And what so. engine? Is it a Ford Flathead? It's a typical hot rod, Ford Flathead. Right. Aluminum heads, uh, single carburetor. Right, so. right. The three-speed? Uh, three speed on the floor, yeah. On the floor, oh, yeah. very nice. Very 1935 cool. Ford wires. Yeah. In beautiful shape. And so. tell me how you came to find it. A research project. One of my good friends, Phil Fleming, uh, we were trying to discover the earliest post war sports cars and trying to document it. They're not right. documented very well. This class is a result of part of that research that we did a number of years ago. And one of the things we established in, in we're talking was a car that he had seen in his youth. Right. And he told me about them when we started with pictures. And within just a few months, we tracked down the history and we tracked down one of the cars. Both Phil is with us today and, and the owner of the car is with us today too, or the previous owner. Oh, is that right? Yeah, uh, what, what kind of shape was it in when you got it? It was a hard restoration because it was in this shape. Oh, oh, <laughs> I see, okay. Uh, he, Alex did a, a beautiful job. He spent yeah. about 15 years slowly yeah. restoring it. Very nice. Well. That is probably the most unusual gear shift lever I have ever seen. Yeah, it's it's uh, the engine transmission on the original locations, mm -hmm. and they brought it back, and that was not uncommon. That was a common thing to do. Right. If you didn't move the engine and transmission back, you actually either had to, to create linkage to bring it back or to bend it in an unusual way. It makes it a bit of a challenge. Of, uh, and shifting. once again, very Duesenberg-like gauges there. Uh, Stuart Warner, 1947, Yeah. Uh, all four. Yeah. Uh, not Mark, but some some Stuart Warners didn't have the wing symbols. They yeah. made a number of different cars. You know, now you see 200 on the speedometer, but back in the late 40s, seeing 100 miles an hour this on was, the speedometer yeah. was, was a big deal. It was. 100, 105 is what the car should wow. have done. Wow, yeah. 105 uh, with a Ford Flathead, that's it, pretty good. Aluminum body, yeah. so it was very light, and that's yeah. part of the reason, plus an engine that was hopped up. And it sits quite low to the ground, doesn't it? And the, if you take a look, the actual fenders are parallel to the ground. They swoop all the way underneath. Yeah, it looks, yeah, he's noticed that. Yeah. And it's obviously yeah. Ford juice brakes all the way around. Absolutely, yeah. 1947. Yeah. Yeah. Everything is custom on the car too. It had to be because the entire yeah. car was coach built or formed. Windshield is bronze, chrome bronze, so is the uh, grill, which weighs 50 pounds, the grill itself. Now, is the chassis Ford as well? Or yeah. did he build Nine, his own chassis? He was planning to do and work with Ford. He was going to um, purchase Ford chassis, 1946. Okay. They, they were going to, then they yanked it. We're not quite sure why, but this is actually 1940 chassis. Okay. 112 inch wheelbase. He, he built a second one a year later too. So. Is it possible to open the hood? Yeah. Oh, we'd love to see underneath. There you go. It's Edelbrock. Uh, look at that. First year Edelbrock's catalog was 1946. Yeah. This is one of the very first uses of the, actually after the catalog of the head. And wow. So I like any car where the generator is almost as big as the engine. That's my favorite thing. Those big giant, they put out like 14 amps or something. When you built a car like this too, your radiator and engine weren't necessarily in the same place. You often had overheating problems. Right. A lot of specials had that. A lot of them didn't idle. So we actually upgraded this with an electric fan. And you got the right battery too. Uh, yeah, we upgraded to a 12 volt system. Six, oh, I see. Six to 12. It was a six, now it's a 12. Well, those Edelbrock heads, that's pretty rare. Uh, yeah, these are a, a slightly older pattern. I call it a block pattern. Yeah, yeah. It's from the 40s. Well, that's beautiful. Jeff, nice job. Thank you so much. Thanks for stopping by. Beautiful car. Cool.